Uh, this is a ca casual conversation with a member of the Board of Trustees. It's sponsored by the Class of 91, so thank you, Class of 91. And uh, that's an applause line. That's right. And David Sutphin, uh, our classmate, is a member of the Board of Trustees. So we asked David if he wouldn't mind coming and having, a, like I said, a casual conversation. So what we're going to do, we have an hour together. And um, David and I are going to spend the first half hour, 45 minutes, talking about different things. I did ask a number of our classmates different topics they wanted to make sure we would cover. So I will try to do that. And we will make sure at the end we'll have at least 15 minutes. If we get to 45 minutes and we're still talking, we will do a hard stop on ourselves uh, to open it up to dig deeper into any of the things we were talking about or to cover anything that anyone would like to, to share. Does that make sense? Great. So uh, topics we will definitely cover. We're going to cover the physical uh, campus, so what's going on with the Science Center and the Greenway and, and some of the other major projects that are happening. What's the vision there? Uh, what do the Board of Trustees talk about with that? And then we will talk about Amherst in the news. And there's been a number of things about Amherst that have been in the news. have won a number of prizes, which is great. Uh, but in addition, there have been some things that are somewhat controversial. And Amherst is uh, tip of the spear on a number of those things. So we're going to talk about those things, issues of diversity and inclusion and, and how Amherst is engaging and wrestling with those issues. So we're going to talk about that as well. Of course, the mascot. We'll talk about that. And, uh, and then really whatever else you'd like to talk about. Does that work? OK. And uh, so Dave, why don't you start us off and uh, Share just a little bit, for those who don't know you as well as I do, what you've been doing since Amherst, and that'll maybe give us a little context for your background and, and the way you see some of these issues. First, it's great to be back. After 25 years, I looked at this picture. I just showed it to my wife, and she said, I can't believe you were ever that thin. So uh, <laughs> uh, there's still hope. Um, I am one of the people in our class who actually graduated without a job, um, and I moved back home to Milwaukee for the summer, and then I moved to Washington, D.C., and slept on the floor of my sister's apartment. My sister was two years ahead of me at Mount Holyoke, uh, and then I managed to get a job at an organization called the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. While I was in Amherst, I was a political science major and a soccer player, and uh, then decided to go to law school, uh, went to Michigan Law School, and actually lived in D.C. for the year at the Lawyers Committee with Dan, who picked a very inconvenient house in Silver Spring where we had to take a bus and the metro to get to work. So it's true. Uh, this is at least a more convenient location Thank for you. our conversation, so I appreciate Thank that. You. Thank uh, you. So, you know, went to Michigan for law school. Uh, I think while I was here, uh, thought I wanted to be a, a civil rights lawyer. And um, as a result of that, worked at a variety of civil rights organizations while I was in law school. And uh, after our law school, I ended up clerking on the US Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. And then I moved to Washington, uh, back to Washington, at, started working at a big law firm there, Covington and Burling. And uh, about two months after I started working there, my best friend from law school, who was a year behind me, got elected to Congress at the ripe age of 26. So I left to go be his first chief of staff. So I was 26. He, he was 25 at the time. I did that for two years, and then I moved to the Senate side to be Senator Kennedy's general counsel on the Senate Judiciary Committee. I did that for four and a half years. Probably the most interesting thing about that experience was I started on the first day of President Clinton's impeachment trial. So the first three months on, my job, on that job were staffing the Senate Democrats uh, on the impeachment trial. I was there during 9-11, during Bush versus Gore, during the anthrax scare, during JFK Jr.'s death. Uh, so it was kind of a tumultuous time politically. And in, in addition to handling Senator Kennedy's civil rights portfolio, which was kind of an honor in light of what I wanted to do with my career at that point, I also handled the business issues on the committee, which were mostly antitrust and intellectual property issues. And right around that time was when 12-year-olds started downloading music for free. Uh, which obviously became a huge kind of cultural, societal, technological, uh, transformational issue. And I left uh, the Senate to be the lobbyist for the major record labels, RIAA. Um, and so spent a lot of time trying to explain why suing 12-year-olds for downloading music was a good idea. Not always successfully. Uh, and then I moved uh, to the media company Viacom and was the senior vice president of government and industry affairs there handling a lot of the regulatory policy political issues that were important to the media and entertainment industry. And then seven years ago, I left Viacom to join a firm that's based in London called Brunswick, which is a privately held global strategic communications firm. I run the Washington office, which 
The firm has about 1,000 people globally. The Washington office is about 55 people. The firm's probably best known for doing major transactional work, so all these big M&A deals that you read about in the newspaper, SAB Miller, AB InBev, Syngenta Chem China, the Bayer deal that just got announced. Our firm handles all the communications around those deals. We also did the Facebook IPO, the Alibaba IPO, the Etsy IPO. We represented BP in their oil spill. So I spend my day job um, thinking about the intersection between reputation, communication, um, stakeholder engagement, which I think is probably one of the reasons why, uh, in light of what Dan alluded to in his opening remarks, uh, the college may have thought that having somebody with that background might be useful for purposes of the kinds of issues that not just Amherst, but any, I think, any institution that I think has a track record of kind of excellence and impact in our society, often, often those institutions in the world we live in now find themselves, you know, in the crosshairs of complex and difficult issues. So uh, I think it's probably a good segue into our actual conversation. So. All right. Well, let me start with uh, let me start with an easy one. Um, being on the board of trustees, do you have a different perspective on the college now? Does that give you insight into our into our college you didn't have before? Yeah, I mean, in, in some respects, it's it it just reminds you of um, what is so special and unique about this place. I'll give you a perfect example. So a couple weeks ago, uh, there's a colleague on the board of trustees who's one of the top physicians in the country and also like a gifted poet. And, and so we went to a poetry reading that he did in conjunction with one of the board of trustees meetings. And you know, those of us who like don't know how to write poetry nor how to open somebody up with a scalpel, <laughs> we're sitting there thinking like, wow, okay, yeah. That's just a, rem a reminder to me about, you know, uh, how this place both attracts and um, you know molds and shapes and you know energizes like very very talented people from very different backgrounds. You know I think one of the things that I have enjoyed the most about the board. I mean it's small. You know there's 22 of us. Um, although I think they're thinking about expanding it by a couple of slots. It's very um, collaborative. We do most of our work as a committee of the whole, and I think for anybody who has spent, um, you know, time working in any kind of organization where kind of governance and decision making are important elements of your job, you can appreciate how important it is to work uh, on a board or in any kind of leadership uh, role where you can actually grapple with complex issues and make decisions. Because I'm a big believer in the fact that uh, you may not get every decision right, particularly in the eyes of, of what is as diverse of a constituency as the you know, Amherst alumni, uh, but the process by which we go about making decisions and the thoughtfulness about which we go about it, I think is something that every trustee, regardless of your point of view on a particular issue, could feel good about. Okay, great. So let's start with, um as we talked about framing the physical campus. So there's a lot of building going on, we all see it. The Merrill Science Center, uh, I was here last fall and they were sharing uh, some things about that and the vision. So what is, why such a big statement about the Merrill Science Center? Why is that so important? Well, you know, as, as many people know, um, I think we live in, oh, I'm sorry, that's my two-year-old in the back. <laughs> um, we, we live in a world where in order to be an elite liberal arts college, you need um, a an amazing science center and an amazing, uh, you know, kind of STEM uh, offerings. And you know, originally we were going to tear down Merrill and put the science center there. And you know, John Middleton chairs the building and grounds committee, and and I think to his credit made a decision a couple of years ago, uh, obviously with the input of the board, that the original approach that they had for reimagining Merrill would not work, which led to uh, the new designs for the Science Center. And just to give folks a sense, you know, we now have um, a Science Center that will be finished in 2018. I think uh, the process by which uh, the trustees and the administration and the faculty engaged uh, faculty and students about what 
they wanted out of a science center. I, I, was a, I was a political science major, as I said, and I was one of those people who made it through four years with never really taking a, a, a hard science course. And I think some of that might have had to do with the intimidating nature of Merrill, but I also think some of it had to do with the fact that, uh, you know, there was a little bit of this divide between, you mm -hmm. know, the science and non-science. Uh, and I think people realize that for students coming here now, you want uh, a kind of a more integrated space and um, kind of teaching and learning uh, place for, for not only the science departments, but for the broader student body. So we have now, I think, for those people who follow what's going on closely in campus, there's basically three things that are going on simultaneously. There's the, the Greenway dorms, which just wrapped up. They just did room draw for the first time for the Greenway dorms, I think about a week and a half ago. The ones down the hill. Those are the ones right, right at the top of the athletic facilities. There's 269 beds in those. And this year, they decided to actually uh, cap the per class um, percentage in those dorms. So 30. 3% of the Greenway dorms will be seniors, 33% will be juniors, and 33% will be sophomores. Um, some of that is driven by, you know, with the loss of the social dorms, kind of what that does to uh, kind of room groups and spaces on campus. The, the Science Center itself will be completed in 2018, and then in conjunction with both the Science Center and the Greenway dorms, they are creating this kind of Greenway landscaping project that's intended to create, I think, a, 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 a more interactive flow uh, across the campus and bring kind of greater dimensionality to what's happening down around the dorms and the Science Center. And in terms of costs, just so, so folks know, I mean, the Science Center has now a, a guaranteed maximum price, $269 million, which is significantly lower than what the original Science Center was. It also will be the uh, highest rated uh, from a sustainability perspective of any science center in the country on, on a college campus. And from a kind of a future growth perspective, one of the benefits of putting it where it is, is we have the ability to expand it if necessary. And you know, you can do the bridge across the railroad tracks in the back. So it, it gives us more flexibility going forward. And I think some of the things that uh, the, the landscape architects are doing with the Greenway will make that portion of campus a really kind of special uh, place, not only for students, but for larger gatherings and other kind of activities, so. So the social dorms, I know for some of my classmates, it's like some of the worst memories, but some of the best memories, perhaps. Uh, maybe not by the end of the year, but uh, by the way, I don't know if any of you all walked by it, but man, they need to come down. Yeah. Uh, wow, just looking in the windows. But um, they did provide a tremendous amount of social space, yep. right? Is there, are there any unintended consequences of taking them down? Are the students going to have those gathering places where mom and dad aren't around? Is, there, yeah, yeah. is that going to happen? Well, that, you know, I mean, to your earlier question about what it's like to be on the board, I think one of the things that's most interesting, and, you know, Biddy mentioned this at a board meeting last week, is when you think about all of the issues that are happening on campus and, um, you know, whether that's, social life, academic life, sporting life, other kinds of things that are, it, it is, um, it's like a, a knitted sweater, you know, and if you pull on one string, you know, you, you, you're trying to understand what the implications of that might be for the fabric of what you're doing. Uh, and, you know, I'll be the first person to admit that there's no, there's no kind of master kind of plan where you're like, we have to do this to do that, to achieve that outcome. But there are some, I think, principles that guide the way we, th we think about it. I mean, the social dorms had to come down. And from a practical perspective, it did not make sense to build dorms that were set up in the same way that the social dorms were. And, and I think what Dan's really getting at is you're losing the kind of the, the, the two rooms connected where eight people in a room group can share one space. That's and what was happening, if anybody's been back on campus, the social dorms had essentially become the hub of the nightlife on campus, but predominantly for athletes, uh, which, um, you know, just some useful statistics, 35% of the student body at Amherst are varsity athletes, which is quite, quite a sizable number. And, you know, obviously the teams have been doing fantastically of late, which is great. Uh, but there are undoubtedly challenges associated with uh, what the social life feels like and the sense of belonging and connectedness that all students feel when you go down to the social dorms on a Friday or Saturday night and, you know, 
there may be a dorm where you know it's just the soccer players or the soccer players partying with the women's lacrosse team or you name it. So I, I think one of the, I wouldn't say unintended consequences, but one of the things that's just gonna happen as a result of the social dorms going away is a slightly different kind of dynamic in terms of, of what spaces are available to do what. You know, the dean of students uh, is, is working collaboratively with the student body around making it easier for students to identify spaces where they can throw parties and not have to worry about, you know, the police showing up or any, you know, people crashing or, or you name it. But at the same time, making sure that there are opportunities where anybody on campus feels like they can show up uh, to an event that, you know, is in a space that ostensibly is open for all. You know, folks may know about the powerhouse, which is our old uh, uh, facility, literally the powerhouse that was reimagined as an event space, and I think that's been a, a great addition to the, the campus life. And in terms of the new Greenway dorms, I mean, the architects were very intentional about how they designed that space, because one of the things that the student body uh, said through a lot of the engagement work uh, that Jim Brassard and his team did is they want more flexible spaces to do various things. So there's kitchens in the new dorms so that people can cook. There are uh, rooms where people can just chill or go do yoga. Uh, but, you know, on a residential campus like this where, you know, there's a lot of competing needs and demands that need to be met, I think there will always be challenges in terms of certain constituencies within the student body feeling like the, the physical plant enables them to do everything that they want to do. All right. So let's switch to Amherst in the news. So sure. the Mellon Grant. Uh, Amherst has recently been recognized and awarded from the Mellon Foundation with yeah. a tremendous honor. Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think um, there are two, I think, big things that are happening at Amherst at the same time, which are both, I think, interrelated to each other and I think re reflect in some respects maybe why we have been in the news a lot lately. So one is, what is a liberal arts um, particularly a residential liberal arts college need to look like in the 21st century in order to remain relevant. You know, you can pick up a lot of newspapers and magazines and you will see, you know, competing theories of the case as to whether some people think liberal arts is still relevant in a society in which kind of hard skills are, uh, seem to be of greater importance, at least in the minds of some when it comes to people's careers. Uh, I think that there is a strong belief, I, I know uh, among the Board of Trustees, I think it's true for the faculty and the administration, and I suspect it's true for the overwhelming majority of people who graduated from this place, that if anything, the opposite is true, which is we live in a world now where it's not enough to just be a great computer science major who can you know, code and kind of uh, solve kind of analytical problems. You need to be able to contextualize the work that you're doing within society and the world more broadly, and that's what a liberal arts education enables you to do. So the Mellon Grant, I think, is a reflection of the fact that uh, they see really great work being done here on campus around reimagining liberal arts so that it retains its, its core but is relevant to what's going on in society. So what do I mean by that? I mean um, there's lots of interesting work going on around the issue of you know, critical thinking and writing skills, particularly for freshmen. So how do you create classes and curriculum that really get at those re real foundational elemental things that if you don't get those right, kind of inhibits you from unlocking the full potential of someone who's trying, you know, to not only succeed here, but get the, get the greatest benefits of a liberal arts education. So that's, that's one, and, you know, unbelievably competitive grant, you know, the kind of grant that lots of uh, the schools that probably people think about sending their kids to, other than Amherst, try to get, and we want it, so that's great. The, the second one, which I, I assume you might be uh, turning to, so I'll just Go Jump for the it. Gun, yeah, is uh, is the Jack Kent Cook million dollar uh, award that we won about a week ago, which is a relatively new award by the Jack Kent Cook Foundation that is focused on elite uh, colleges and universities that are doing the best job of educating and providing opportunities for um, kids of all socioeconomic backgrounds and you know 
diverse backgrounds. And again, you know, Stanford, Pomona, you know, lots of other schools, Wellesley, we're all competing for that, and, and we want it. And I think, you know, it's a reflection, I, I, I don't know how closely people follow this, but there's a very interesting report that came out yesterday from a group of faculty at Yale, uh, faculty of art, from the Arts and Sciences School, about some of these very same issues. And, you know, uh, as we get into some of the, the I think, the more controversial uh, parts of our discussion regarding the uprising and other things, I think we can talk about, at least in my view, how I see all of these things interconnected and why at the end of the day, um, although there have been things that have happened on campus that I think, um, I, I totally understand why um, alums of all ages and diff all backgrounds looked at and kind of were like, what's up with that? That seems completely at odds with you know my understanding of what our school is about, so. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, let me, let me. But, you, it's a Jack Ken Cook award, right? And I think those who are aware how Jack Ken Cook made his money was the owner of the Washington Redskins, and that's still the name of the football team, right? And that's uh, that's their mascot. They are the Redskins. Yeah. Is there any irony there that there's the money's coming from there, and here we've changed from the Lord Jeff to we don't know what? That's a good question. Yeah. I, so I haven't thought look, about that curveball. Wrong sports go. analogy. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I guess um, I guess the difference. I would say, yes, there's, I guess, on the surface irony. I think the difference between, you know, Jack Ken Cook and the Redskins and Amherst is, you know, there's one guy that owns the team. So, you know what? If it's your team and you own it, you can do whatever the heck you want. Mm -hmm. You know, and you can, you can decide that you want to be responsive to con certain constituencies or make people feel like you are addressing what I think are legitimate concerns, or you can say, you know what, screw you, because it's my team and I'm going to do what I want to do. Right. You know, we, we don't, I think for good reason, have the ability to do that at a place like this, because we, we are a constituency of, you know, lots of people, I mean, all of you wouldn't be sitting here if you didn't feel an, a kind of an emotional and um, connection to the college, and also a sense of pride, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so when things happen on campus, that kind of run counter to those uh, emotional connections that you feel with the university, I mean the college, it, it's, it's totally understandable that the reaction is, you know, what the heck is going on. Uh, but I, I, I guess surfacely ironic, but not yeah. substantively ironic. Fair enough. So let's talk about the mascot a little bit more in depth. Sure. So um, from your perspective on the board, yep. um, what, were, what was the discussion like? What was, uh, what was that whole process like? Right. to go through. And then obviously, but then we'll get into, well, what's next? You know? yeah. I think we have some ideas about potential mascots. Right. Um, well, I, you know, I'm obviously not gonna get into a discussion about like what we actually talked about in, in, the, in the actual board meeting, but I mean, you know, I, I know 25 years ago when we were here, this issue was kind of swirling. It, sometimes it would flare up more than others. So, I, you know, I don't think that this is an issue that is kind of new, per se. I do think that when you look at um, the makeup of the student body now compared to, you know, 25, 50, 100, 150 years ago, it, it's completely different. And, you know, I think one of the things that, you know, Cullen Murphy often says, who's the chair of the board, is, you know, we want um, Amherst to be a diverse intellectual community where all three of those words have equal meaning. And uh, in order to do that, when you have a diverse student body, and, and I, I think there's a couple things that are worth kind of flagging when we talk about, at least when I say diverse. Uh, first of all, interestingly, um, you know, Amherst has obviously 44% 44 of the student body um, self-identifies themselves as students of, of color, but interestingly, the Venn diagram overlap between that constituency and lower income first gen is not like the same cohort. So I think there, there may be a perception that the students of color on campus are also the first gen low income students and that's not necessarily the case. There's obviously some uh, overlap. The other thing that I think is worth pointing out in, in the context of all, all of these discussions is that um, from a purely um, quantitative academic rigor perspective, the the SAT scores and ACT scores of the incoming classes over the last several years have been the highest that they've been in the history of the college. So I think the other thing that's important for people to understand, I, I, and I'm not projecting on anybody's point of view on this, but there, there is a, 
because I do a lot of this work, a, a natural instinct to believe that in order to get to that 44% number, it meant that you had to somehow go in the opposite direction in terms of what it means for the, you know, the SAT scores and the ACT scores and the GPAs of students coming into the, in, into the campus. So going back to the, uh, to, the, to the mascot, you know, I mean, from a, uh, it, I guess I would go back to what, uh, one of the points that I made earlier about what it's like to be on the board. You know, you look around the country, you've got, you know, the debate in South Carolina about whether you take down the Confederate flag. You've got, you know, what's going on at Georgetown about, you know, th them having sold slaves. You've got issues on Yale's campus about uh, Calhoun. You've got issues on Princeton's campus about uh, the Woody Woo School. So I think the first thing I would say is we are not alone in this. And so, you know, the reaction that I think some Amherst alums have at like, oh my God, you know, the college is, is somehow kowtowing. This is just the reality of the world we live in. And you know, for better or for worse, I think maybe some people wish that these issues weren't as top of mind as they are, but they are. And for better or for worse, we have to figure out a way to deal with them. And I think, you know, as I said you know, 15 minutes ago, we are all very smart people. We all have different points of view. And we could probably debate until you know, we you know, were blue in the face as to whether the decision, quote unquote, was the right decision. Um, but a decision needed to be made, in my view. And, and I think the process by which the decision may, was made was a thoughtful one. It was one that was, I think, uh, designed to try in as best of a way we could as an institution to get feedback from the constituencies that matter the most, the students, the faculty, alumni. Um, and then as a board, I think we felt like, you know, okay, we just have to decide. Um, what we're going to do, uh, because in an institution like this, where you inevitably are going to face complex, controversial issues that don't live in the vacuum um, and in isolation on your campus, but are a function of some of the broader external societal forces that are sh shaping what's going on uh, in, in today's world, like the worst thing you can do is just ki keep kicking the can down the road and. Uh, hoping that things go away, you have to figure out a way to make decisions, you know, and, and move on. So we made a decision. I know there were some people that were not happy with it. The way I look at it is, um, you know, I mean, I was, like I said, I was an athlete, I was a soccer player. I, I never f was that thrilled about the Lord Jeff. This is my own personal view. I never got it to begin with. I thought it was a lame mascot all along. I can understand why some people have you know, a personal affinity to it, but I think there's a lot of other things, I call it substantive symbolism, that are much more substantively symbolic about what this college stands for than the mascot itself. And you know, my sense is, and I could be wrong, that for at least some alums who have concerns about what happened with the mascot, that that's really a proxy for a, a deeper concern that is about other things, because I can't imagine that the mascot itself is the thing that like is really getting people that bent out of shape because we all have many more important things to be worried about in our lives than the mascot itself. I suspect that it it may be um, you know a window into I think what are legitimate you know questions and concerns that people may have about what's happening on campus and you know what are we doing as a college and are we doing the right things. Right. So. Well, I did promise. Uh, I have four kids at home, and they were debating on what should be the mascot. So I'm going to take this opportunity, because they know yeah. I'm speaking to you. Uh, they voted for um, the frost. But when I explained that that doesn't really go with purple, they suggested the purple frost. So for the record, some of you can vouch with me with my kids. I did, in fact, suggest the purple frost. So okay. uh, thank you. Well, I'm, I'm abstaining from that, that whole process. <laughs> I didn't I, ask your I already opinion. made my vote, so. My uh, job was to deliver the opinion, not, yeah, to, not to solicit yours. All good. Excellent. So, um, so we touched on some ideas, and, and yeah. thank you. You brought up some, some topics that are uh, uh, sensitive but real. Yeah. And Amherst is certainly engaging in them. So uh, diversity was one of the words uh, that you spoke about, and certainly uh, a core value uh, of the college. And if one reads, whether it's even the New, you know, whether it's the New York Times or the news sources, certainly, is a, uh, certainly uh, those of us uh, who are members of the community read, and it's not always about Amherst, of course, but I read about college campuses, and one will say, one can get a read from that, from certain, certain, certain media for sure, is our college is becoming less diverse as far as opinion, political yeah. viewpoints. Yeah. Do you have a sense of that, and do you, do you think that 
Amherst uh, is a place where diversity of opinion uh, is true and welcome uh, from, all, from all sides and perspectives. I mean, I, th I, th I think that that is a, you know, a, a, a completely legitimate discussion. And, you know, interestingly, when I look at the kinds of discussions we have on the board, we do have a pretty broad uh, universe of, of kind of political thought, I think, in, in terms of, of people's predisp predispositions around that. Um, you know, I, maybe this is a sign of the fact that I am getting a little bit older, but you know, the, the discussions going on on campus about you know, certain words you can't use and you know, various things, like that concerns me. You know, um, I, I feel like at the end of the day, the purpose, and you know, the, the, the president just said this, I think, at his commencement address at Howard, which is, you know, you don't go to college to be shielded from things that you know make you uncomfortable or opinions that are different than yours. <laughs> like, especially at a place like this. I mean, talk about doing like a whole generation of, of students a disservice. Um, I, I think, um, you know, with Professor Arkey's kind of you know s stepping away from campus. I mean, you know, when we were here, that was kind of like. You know the Archie Serret. You felt like you had you know the two masters of the universe that were battling on both sides of, of the you know political spectrum. I feel like that made the campus richer. I know that there were some you know uh, flare ups around speakers and the like. So I, I even though I'm clear, I mean I work for Ted Kennedy. Clearly I'm a I'm a I'm a big Democrat, but. Uh, I would be as big of an advocate for the for a much more intentional uh, approach to ensuring that we have that kind of breadth of, of kind of intellectual perspective. I think, unfortunately, uh, and again, this is where I think the outside world intrudes sometimes, is we live in a world where that often gets conflated purely with like political point of view, and the two are not the same. I mean, you know, a Andy Nussbaum, cl clerk for Justice Scalia, I mean, you know, uh, but I would pick Andy over tons of my progressive liberal friends if I had to solve a difficult problem with somebody whose you know, mind I respected and who I thought was a, um, you know, a thoughtful person who was motivated by the right kind of principles. So uh, I, I think the challenge, and, and this is where I think these issues are hard to unwrap from each other. If you come to Amherst and you feel like you are um, th the other, and that can that can uh, manifest itself in a lot of ways. Or, you know, maybe you're a foreign student, um, uh, you know. Maybe you're a first gen student, and it's, so it's not just about uh, people of color. But I think the the more that we can make students feel that they belong here, and that their differences are respected and are part of the the, the richness of the kind of intellectual discourse that needs to go on on campus, I actually think those issues become less acute because you know it's just as bad for a you know 20 year old white guy who you know grew up in Greenwich who maybe just because of the nature of where he grew up and went to school hasn't been in a diverse environment like Amherst who feels a little bit uncomfortable saying something in class because he's afraid that people are going to judge him that's that's as much of a of a challenge and an issue that the school needs to be sensitive to as to the you know the kid who's the f first in his generation to go to college and shows up on campus and doesn't even know what it means to like you know get an internship and you know people look at it. So I mean everyone is coming to this place and we all I mean we were joking a few minutes ago you know when when you think about who you are when you show up at this place you're you're basically kind of you know slightly molded clay, but you know, not hardened and, and malleable in lots of interesting ways, and, you know, which is why I, I, I think a huge component of solving for those kinds of issues around um, political thought and diversity of political thought uh, are wrapped up in you know, the quality of the faculty yeah. that we have. Because at the end of the day, a, a good faculty member, regardless of their political views, should be able to uh, bring out a debate and a discussion in a class that allows people to kind of see things from lots of different perspectives. Yeah, that's great. I, and, and I will say, a few of us were commenting earlier, there's a number of students working here, and uh, a number of us, a, a couple of us engaged them in conversation, and I will say that's remarkable clay. I mean, the, there's just no question the college is bringing on pretty extraordinary folks. 
on the campus these days. So yeah. uh, th good things are happening. So uh, you touched on Amherst Uprising yep. and how a number of campuses uh, around the country and, and certainly not just the Northeast yep. are dealing with similar issues. Um, from my perspective, Amherst dealt with it differently than other schools. I think the administration have a, had a different approach. I was wondering if you could comment on that and uh, sure. your view of that and how the college yeah. responded. Uh, I mean, a couple things. Uh, the first thing I would say is probably like everyone in this room, when I picked up the New York Times and I read the list of original demands that the students wrote, I kind of was like, are you serious? Like, <laughs> did, did they like, you know, forget to put some thought into stuff before, you know, but you know, you, you also have to understand that, um, you know, I, I think it's important to contextualize what, what happened on campus because when you hear the word Amish uprising, I think it, it implies that there was like a, a rush on the, you know, frost and, you know, people were, it, it, it literally started off very casually. I, I was back last weekend for uh, commencement and for the board of trustees meeting and ended up at the soccer tent and talking to a couple of the guys in the team who said that, you know, later in the day as more students started to converge on campuses, a lot of the uh, coaches of the athletic teams encouraged the teams to go. And, you know, the soccer team has one of the mo most diverse teams on, on campus, the men's soccer team. And uh, so the young guy I was talking to, you know, white, white kid who just graduated, uh, was like, hey, you know, the whole team decided to go because we felt like you know, this is something important happening on campus. So the first thing I think is to contextualize it, which is this was not like people marching you know, down the streets with you know, uh, trying to like, burn down a building or anything like that. So the uprising thing, I think, uh, sometimes, especially if, you, if you're not as close to the campus, maybe misinterpreted it in some ways. I, I, the other thing I would say is uh, two, two things I took away from it. One is um, we are blessed to have Biddy as our president. And uh, to the extent that any, any of you have not had a chance to interact with her personally, you should find an opportunity to do that because it is very difficult in this day and age. And, I, I, and you know, I'm not just talking about a college. I'm talking about any institution that requires principled leadership to find someone who has the capacity to both um, think about things intellectually articulate them both verbally and in writing in a very compelling and thoughtful way and also has like an unbelievably high EQ. That is a very difficult thing to find in one person. And Biddy has them all. And I think the way that she handled the uh, original demands that the students um, uh, kind of put out. And I would encourage everyone, if you haven't, uh, to actually look at the second list of demands that the students put together. Because first of all, it came very quickly on the heels of the first. But second of all, I would argue it is a reaffirmation of the fact that like our students are actually quite thoughtful. Because if you look at the second set of demands, it evidences a fa the fact that they went back and they actually put thought into it and they realized that you know maybe their first uh, set of demands was uh, caught up maybe in the emotion of the moment. And they took a step back and they said, you know what, what's, what's an actually a more thoughtful approach to this? And interestingly, and you know, it's, it's hard to know this because, you know, uh, it's, you know, my, my sister used to be deputy chief of staff to President Obama and the, you know, Obama's had a rule of like no new friends, you know, when they came to Washington. And one of the reasons for that is, uh, you know, once you become president of the United States, like you don't know where, what anybody's motivations are. It's kind of, this is a stretch of an analogy, but like I don't know whether what students say to me now is accurate because I'm a trustee, but, um, but if you go around campus and you talk to students of all different backgrounds and classes, I think almost uniformly, at least based upon my experience since the uprising, they will say it was a good thing. Now, do we agree with everything that happened right after it, but what it's done for the campus because to your earlier question about political thought and is this a place where there isn't sufficient room for it? Well, guess what? These issues are interrelated because you know, the ability to my earlier point of a, a student of color to talk honestly about you know, some of the challenges of what it's like to be on this campus also creates the room for other people who uh, have different issues and challenges. So in some respects, I think for the collective 
of the universe, I mean the college, to have that conversation. I, I, I actually think net, net, it was a good thing. And the other thing that was useful about it is the students have taken on the primary responsibility for um, what needs to happen from here, as opposed to just coming to the administration and the faculty and expecting that you know they can solve for that. Because I think they realize at the end of the day, a lot of this is about the one-on-one -on -one interactions that happen, not just in the classroom, but you know when you're out on the athletic field or at Valentine or just socializing. So great. So uh, we're going to open it up to, to questions and comments uh, in a moment. But the, so sort of one last question for you, David. So part of your job, you uh, regularly are counseling CEOs at fairly dramatic times. Often uh, it can be a, a communications crisis. Yep. It could be a merger and acquisition, and how do we present that either to shareholders, the general public? Yep. You were speaking just a moment about uh, about President Martin and and uh, her leadership, and also how the college is grappling with some of these issues. Anything you could pull out from that? What positive lessons? What leadership lessons? Is there anything there you would say is transferable? And whether folks in here are leading law firms, leading businesses, leading well, you know, it's in interesting. Um, I think one of the things that I've learned, particularly in the last seven years, is you often hear people talk about the concept of crisis management. And uh, as an advisor and as a firm, we one of the first things we say to people is, there's no such thing as crisis management. What really matters is like leadership in crisis. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think, because at the end of the day, we, we live in a world now where, um, you know, I mean, there's a story, you, you can't pick up the newspaper any day without, uh, I mean, look, think about the kid who was like, you know, supposed to be the number two draft pick in the NFL, and like two minutes before he thinks he's gonna get yeah. picked, there's a picture of him smoking a bong, like up on, you know, spreading around. I mean, you, you, you are fooling yourself if you think that we live in a world where you can prevent these things from happening, or that you can manage them. The, what you can do is control the things that you can, which is you can, you can show leadership, and part of showing leadership, I think, is being as transparent as you possibly can be about what you think is going on, what you think caused it, and what you think you, can, you are gonna be able to do based upon the information that you have to solve for it. And, and I think, you know, Biddy, um, it's been interesting. I mean, you know, she has gotten some pretty ugly correspondence from alums in the wake of all of this stuff that's going on. And, and the thing that troubles me the most about that is it's, it's in many respects, it's the exact equivalent of like what the students did, you know? It's, it's, it's one of those things. If you think that the way they reacted to that is, is, is not becoming of an Amherst grad, then, you know, s sending, you know, th uh, correspondence to Biddy that's like on the edge of kind of hate mail is not also like a way to solve and work our way through these complex issues. Um, so, the, I, I, you know, um, and the, the other thing I would say, and you know, we were joking about this when we did our prep call, is, you know, when you work in the communications world, you realize that when you pick up the newspaper and you read something that you know a lot about, if it's a good reporter, 70% of the information in the article is accurate. If they're a bad reporter, it's probably 30% of the information in the article is accurate. The irony, of course, is that when you read stuff in the newspaper that you either have some limited knowledge of or no knowledge of, you never make that same assumption. You just assume that everything in the article is accurate. And so one of the things that I would, I would say to people is the next time you pick up an article about Amherst, good or bad, and you read it, and it either makes you, you know, uh, jump with joy because you think it's the best thing in the world, or it makes you cringe, uh, just pause for a moment and think that maybe everything that's uh, conveyed in this article may not be completely accurate to the T. Because uh, I know every single one of us has had that experience with something that we're, we're working on or involved in personally. So. Okay. Great. Thanks, David. Yep. So we'd love to open it up. Questions, opinions, thoughts? I know we'll have a few. Sure. Board address and should address 
Yeah. Uh, she, in the end, is your employee, right? Yeah. And she serves at her discretion. And if she's being attacked for using the board funds inappropriately, why can't you take a more public role in addressing those attacks? Well, you may have been taking that a lot of yeah. policies, but that's, that's, that's a stance that. I mean, I think. You know, th there's a couple of issues, I think, related to answering that. One is, I mean, there's obviously, if someone writes an individual letter to the president, she's not going to, like, show it to us and say, you know, this person in the class of whatever. Uh, but she does, I think, give us a sense as to the, um, you know, the sentiment in the correspondence that she gets. I think specifically to the issue of what can the trustees do more of, I think one of the things that we've realized is, Maybe we need to do a better job, uh, particularly as it relates to you know, the cohort of classes that we're closest to, of communicating more effectively. I mean, I think the college has realized that uh, when things go bump in the night, there is a tendency to, as is the case with any organization, you know, all eyes go to Biddy. Um, and what can we do on a more consistent basis to communicate in a, in a more uh, in-depth and compelling way to to alums so that they have more context and perspective on what's going on because I think the sense is the more they have the less likely you are to have those um, situations but you're also um, you know the reality is we all know I mean you know there's always going to be some people who you know have a bee in their bonnet you know and uh, and are just going to be acerbic. I mean, it's just the nature of the, we probably all have classmates like that. We probably work with people like that. Uh, but I do feel um, that the board, as a general matter, looks at, you know, Biddy's been here for five years. Uh, I think she's been an, a spectacular president. But she's had some, you know, really challenging issues that have happened. And as I said, we're blessed to have her lead us through those. But it's been a strain on her, um, you know, and a lot of the responsibility to communicate falls on her shoulder. Fortunately, she's a gifted writer. So if anything, I think we have been supportive of her in the ways that, you know, the, the, the board of a corporation would be with a CEO that's going through a really difficult challenge. It's like, what can we, are there additional people you may need on your team? Are there things that we can do? Making sure that she goes on a, on a vacation. I mean, there are, uh, but you know, we're also sensitive to the fact that this college has always had a very strong uh, kind of faculty, student-led uh, uh, approach, and that you have to be delicate about how um, present and involved the trustees are as things kind of flare up on campus. Okay. Sir? Yes, two quick questions. Well, they're not going to be quick, but <laughs> the answers are going to be quick. As you know, uh, going back to the protest and all of the claims that they made, racism, white superiority, every ism that you can imagine, including some that I don't know what they are, such as ableism. Right. And you take a look at Biddy's answer to that. She said after meeting for three hours with the protesters, she heard their stories and their pain and that she agreed with them, these aren't her words, but we have a serious racism discrimination problem here at Amherst. The thing that frustrated me and many other alumni was we never received the documentation behind this. To what extent does this racism discrimination emanate from students? What class of students, how much from faculty, how much from admissions, how much from college policy. Right. Uh, that's the first part of my question. The second part is, uh, you know, some alumni have concern about what action the trustee might take in the future. I know this is a crystal ball, that's hard to answer. Right. But you see what a lot of other colleges are doing, responding to student demands in terms of taking steps to perhaps isolate them from microaggressions, including what Dartmouth has done recently to authorize the spending of large amounts of money to build a separate building where certain classes, gays, and others can seek refuge, and spending huge amounts of money to address the racism issue. 
Yeah. I realize, you know, looking into the crystal ball, you're going to say, we have to wait to see. But I'm also anxious to see what the students come up with, what comes out of these panels that are looking at these issues, what are they going to recommend? Yeah. Has there been any discussion on, on any of these two points? Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, uh, just a little personal background on me. So, you know, my father is black and Native American and my mother is Polish Russian Jew. So I, I grew up in, a, in an integrated family that was kind of all mixed up on a lot of levels. So I, um, and I, th I think it's safe to say that any elite institution in our society, uh, which is increasingly diverse, is grappling with issues of, and you know, racism is a very heavy word, and it, and it ha also has obviously some pretty profound kind of legal dimensions to it. I, I do think that there are um, kind of challenging issues around class, race, privilege on campus. Um, whether I would say that it's, it's racism, I, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I had a couple of experiences personally on campus where I got called the N-word. I would have said that that was racist, but I wouldn't have called the campus racist as a result of that. Um, so, you know, and, and I actually think, you know, interestingly, um, to Dan's earlier question about the kind of campus life dynamic. So you, you, just, just to put some things in context. So 44% of the student body is of color, but a much smaller percentage of the student body um, are of color are varsity athletes. So in other words, you have a disproportionately large number of the team sports that are less diverse than the student body as a whole. Um, so when you think about how all of these issues interplay in the, and you also have a, a dynamic where there are a lot more women of color on campus than there are men of color, which is a broader societal issue associated with the fact that, you know, African American girls and Latinas do better than their male counterparts generally from an academic perspective. So, you know, you think of you got, you know, 1600, 18 to 22 year olds swirling around campus where, you know, down in the social dorms, there may be athletic team parties. There's, I mean, it is a very complicated milieu of, of people's individual identities, their uh, you know, lack of comfort or experience dealing with people who are different than them, and learning how to navigate that. And, um, and you know, there's no easy answer to it, and I don't think we will ever get to a place where there won't be some students here who feel like the campus is uninviting. Now, are there things that we can do to um, minimize that? I think we can. Uh, you know, we're waiting uh, on some of the recommendations from the, some of the student advisory committees that have been put together. Biddy also um, put together kind of an outside advisory group on issues of diversity that we're also waiting for some feedback on. So to your specific point about can you give me concrete examples and what has come out of that, I can't answer that. To the question of, of you know, the slippery slope of you know, when are you gonna, you know, uh, kind of succumb to certain demands of the students? I mean, if you think about it, you know, we had this issue with divestment related to, you know, fossil fuels. I, I feel like as a board, we dealt with that in a thoughtful way, which is to say it's a legitimate issue. The environment sustainability is a legitimate, legitimate issue, but we have a fiduciary duty as it relates to our uh, endowment that yes, should we be looking for uh, investment managers who are, are taking into account environmental sustainability and governance um, factors when they're putting their portfolios together? Yes, but are we going to put in place a hard and fast rule that we would never have uh, uh, an advisor manage money who happens to have you know, a, a, a carbon company in his or her portfolio? We're not gonna do that. So, you know, and Colin wrote this in, I think his letter after the uprising, he said, you know, some people will say that this is a slippery slope um, and there's no way to stop. And I think his point was, well, yeah, you just stop. So, um, which I, I, it's, it's a lot to ask, I think, of alums. But I think, you know, someone once told me who's the CEO of a company, you know, the hardest thing to do sometimes, but the thing that often um, is, the, 
is very helpful is to give <laughs> people in decision-making positions some benefit of the doubt. And I, I would hope um, that the alumni as a whole would, would look at who's on the board of trustees and believe that you know, we, we are in trying to do the right thing. Sometimes the issues we, we face are very complex and you know, sometimes we may get it wrong, but it's not because we're not, uh, I think, taking a principled approach, recognizing that some of the demands that students ask, we just got a demand from the student body to add two you know, trustees who've graduated within five years to the board of trustees and we said we weren't gonna, we weren't gonna do that. Um, so I think we've, we have demonstrated a capacity to draw lines when they need to be drawn, so. Yes. There are two issues facing the college that have financial implications for the board. Um, one of those issues is, is the dumbbell effect in terms of this college is very affordable for people who are very wealthy, very affordable for people who have no income. Yep. But the people in even you know two, three hundred thousand dollars a year, yep. they're getting stolen away with merit scholarships and so on and so forth. So, so doing something to, for those, those folks, you know, number one. Number two would be, it, it's my understanding, we're trailing, say, Williams and Pomona on a uh, student-faculty ratio, and, that, and that's a strict board decision. So I'm just curious from the board's perspective, what are you doing uh, to deal with these two things that, are, that obviously have financial impacts mm -hmm. you know, on, on the campus? Uh, you, you you're definitely right on the first one. I mean, we, 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 we spend a lot of time in the context of our discussions with Katie Fretwell, the Dean of Admissions, who's basically like, it's, it's uh, middle income and I guess in the United States, people would say, you know, more than middle income. So 250, 300,000, where you get some financial aid, but you don't get, uh, you know, as you know, I mean, there's only, we are, we are one of only a handful of schools that has no loan need blind admission across the board, not just for domestic students, but for international students. We, don't quote me on this, I think we may be the only school that's left that does that for international students. Um, you know, as is always the case, there's been discussion about, you know, is our approach to um, our packages, do we need to kind of think about making different choices on some of those. Um, you know, there, there, I know that there are some people who have said, you know, well, maybe for st students, families who can afford it, if people knew what the real cost was, that, you know, maybe, I, it's tough, it's tough. And, you know, the endowment, obviously the markets have not been great, so that also uh, places a, 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 a constraint on it. You know, people are looking at, um, you know, some Supreme Court decisions that are floating around that could have implications for what we're capable of doing from our admissions policies, uh, you know, as it relates to, to race and other things. And, and so I guess the short answer is, it's definitely a topic of conversation. It's definitely something that I think um, Katie and uh, the board are aware of, but I can't tell you that we have a, a good solution at this point. And I'm not sure that there is gonna be an easy solution. Uh, we may ultimately just end up having to make a judgment about um, is ins ensuring that essentially middle class kids can come to Amherst more important from a financial aid support perspective than some of the other stuff that we're, uh, we're doing right now. So, and to your, to your second point, uh, we did recently um, green light a, a couple of more additional FTEs as it relates to um, the broadening out the faculty. Uh, you know, it's, it's always a delicate ba balance because on the one hand, there's a desire to, um, so take, take something like computer science. You know, the, the classes are o already oversubscribed. There's a desire for more computer science professors. Um, recruiting them is a challenge. Um, I think if you were to talk to Katherine Epstein, she would feel quite good about the caliber of faculty that we have been able to bring in to Amherst over the last five to 10 years because there has been you know, a pretty substantial um, uh, cohort of faculty who are all near and dear to our experiences here who are reaching you know, the end of, of their tenure. So the, I think the good news is that the caliber of our faculty 
is as high as it's ever been. And I think if you were to look at the kind of the age curve of it, it's 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 balanced, I think, in a pretty way, a good way now in terms of, you know, long tenured um, faculty, uh, kind of that middle cohort and the young guns that are coming in. Uh, but the specific choices around additional um, uh, faculty and then in some respects, an even more difficult choice is once you do agree, like how do you make the decision as to you know which departments are the ones that uh, that that get them, and you know we you know unfortunately have had a couple of issues with a couple of departments that needed to kind of be completely reimagined, um, so that has an implication in in, in it, uh, which you know interestingly I th I, th I hope one of the things that that you know all of you will take away from this conversation is you know. It's not easy to be, it's not easy to run a, uh, an institution like this anymore. And in some respects, I feel like this is a function and part of how society has changed, and with more transparency and social media and the like. And I see this not just in, at Amherst. I see it at major nonprofit organizations I do work with. You see it in the corporate world. You see it. Um, you, you know, Amherst didn't really have a real C CFO until five years ago. You know, we didn't really have a real um, serious, serious general counsel. That doesn't mean we didn't have very talented people who were wonderful stewards of, you know, the college and, you know, uh, more than capable of what they were supposed to be doing. It's just the demands of, of what you need to do to, to balance these things now have just become much more complex. And I think one of the things that Biddy de deserves immense credit for is the, the caliber of the administrative staff that surrounds her now, I think is as strong as it's ever been. And the other thing that I think is a great tribute to her is the, the rapport and comedy between the faculty, the administration, and the board, I think is as good as it's been in a long time. Now, obviously, I haven't been on the board that long. But from everything that I hear, um, the, I think the faculty appreciate the more complex environment that we're operating. Kevin, who is our CFO, presents to the faculty about some of the challenges associated with making the economic model of a small liberal arts college you know, work that is quite generous. And so, I, I put it this way, I feel like all of the elemental parts of what it takes to make this college work and ultimately try and grapple with some of these complex issues that, you know, some of which have been kind of imposed upon us and some of which uh, have, um, you know, just born out of the realities of, of what we're building and doing, that we are as purpose built now to solve those as we have ever been. And you know that gives me some comfort that hopefully we'll do a decent job of it. All right, that's great. Well, we've come to the end of our time. We will be staying uh, to talk, but, but I, I do need to end on time. I, I made a commitment to the, to the college. Um, there is another group coming in, an investment panel. Uh, but again, David is going to, we'll stay for a few minutes, so please don't feel that we're, you know, heading for the door. Um, but I do need to respect the time. But I did want to thank David for being here, uh, class of 91, and the, for sponsoring it. And for those, uh, I really do want to thank David because, it, you know, for a, board of, for a member of the Board of Trustees to come and be so transparent with some of the issues that they're grappling with is, is uh, Remarkable, and regardless, so if I'm not on the board next year. You'll know why. That's right. And regardless of your perspective on the issues, I think you'd agree that David and the board, and certainly at least David, are wrestling with these in a very, very thoughtful manner. And we, we definitely appreciate it, David. So thank you thank for being you, here. Sir. Appreciate it.